Sudasvitsia, my washers and dryers. Welcome back to the laundromat during this thick non fix season. Um, if my hat wasn't a giveaway or if you missed my last video, um, we're reading Stalin, Court of the Red Czar by Simon Seabag Montefiore. Disclaimer, before we get into all of it, as I intend to give on every video in this update, Stalin's a controversial figure, communism's a controversial political ideology. Everything that I am talking about is about Stalin. Everything will be filtered through the lens of Stalin. I don't care if you think communism is a great system of government. I don't care if you hate communism. I'm going to be saying communism and socialism so many times. <laughs> this is not a discussion on that. There are channels for that. There are forms for that. I don't care. I, I really just want to read about them. There's some terrible things that happen, and there are terrible things that are going to happen in the name of socialism, communism, whatever. It's just what happened. Also, this is my interpretation of it. You could read this book and have a totally different takeaway. Also, this is his interpretation of events. Don't yell at me. <laughs> But basically, I have so far read the prologue part one and part two, and part two, that takes us up to 1936. The prologue and part one is 1878 to 1932, and then part two is like 1932 to 1936. So that's about where we're, where we're at. And he takes a very fast approach to all of this, so we're given a very cursory overview of Stalin's childhood being born in the country of Georgia, his various like attempts at seminary. He was in seminary for a few years and then was expelled. Uh, he got arrested and exiled a couple times. And then he joined like his given political movements. Basically what Simon Sebeg Montefiore wanted to do is to give Stalin a fair shake at a biography. A lot of people are just like, he's the mustachioed bad guy. Like literally, <laughs> literally every Soviet bad guy is Joseph Stalin. And he wanted to give him like a more balanced approach to really evaluate his life as it would have been lived. He does a really good job of summing him up just on page six when he says, Garulis, sociable and a fine singer. This lonely and unhappy man ruined every love relationship and friendship in his life by sacrificing happiness to political necessity and cannibalistic paranoia. And that is a theme that runs throughout the whole thing. We will find that the party is your life. The party is your family. The party is you. And it's really interesting to see people attach themselves to figures less than a party in a service. Uh, I just said that the party was everything, but it's interesting that the party can be manipulated if you don't side with the right person. <laughs> so the first chapter is the Georgian and the schoolgirl, and the Georgian refers to Stalin and the schoolgirl refers to Nadia, who would become his wife. She was three when they met. <laughs> I thought all of his atrocities happened after he became leader of the Soviet Union. Turns out they started way sooner. But uh, we also spend some time uh, at the beginning. So uh, again, Stalin was born in Georgia and he he had like a weird relationship with his parents. I think his dad either died or left pretty early. Um, I believe his mom even kicked his dad out. And his mom was a very like harsh disciplinarian and he, he adopted a lot of that himself. Um, there were a lot of priests that were in his village and would come in and out of his house. So he had a lot of experience with kind of that uh, brand of religion and may have inspired him to go to seminary in the first place. But yeah, it's it's kind of interesting to see that, that all play out. Um, after he gets kicked out of seminary, um, he he kind of finds Vladimir Lenin and, and his work. Uh, Koba, there, there are a couple names for Joseph Stalin that we see as we learn about him. There's Koba and there's Soso. I, th I think Soso. Uh, we see Soso. Here's the thing. There's so many different people who all have the same name and therefore all have the same nicknames, so we can't even break it down that much. But Stalin himself, Koba avidly supported Vladimir Lenin in his seminal work, What is to be Done. This domineering political genius combined the Machiavellian practicality of seizing power with mastery of Marxist ideology. Exploiting the schism that would lead to the creation of his own Bolshevik party, Lenin's message was that a supreme party of professional revolutionaries could seize power for the workers and then rule in their name in a dictatorship of the proletariat until this was no longer necessary because socialism had been achieved. So this is the big goal that dominates a lot of Stalin's like early years. And this is a thread that continues of like banding together overthrowing the bourgeois that's like that's the thing <laughs> and there's like this conflict between Lenin and Trotsky um, and Stalin and Trotsky because like Lenin's the I forget how that interaction goes basically Stalin was very shrewd and he didn't immediately try to seize power he instead became like a secretary essentially and so any correspondence that went between Trotsky and Lenin 
came through Stalin. And the reason Trotsky would send letters to Lenin via Stalin is because Trotsky knew that the police didn't really care about Stalin. They cared about Lenin, they cared about Trotsky, but it was way easier to send correspondence to Stalin than it would be to send to Lenin. Stalin learned a lot from Trotsky, and he learned a lot from Lenin. And one of the things that Siebeck Montefiore points out that, you know, Lenin is like, use whatever force you have to. If you have to kill people, kill people. Do it. And it was here that Stalin grasped the convenience of death as the simplest and most effective political tool. And that is another theme that we will see come up many times later. <laughs> Basically, the, the book does a very good job, even in just this first chapter, of establishing the themes that will follow Stalin throughout his life. The chapter continues and we get the formation of the party, and that's capital P party. So Lenin thus proposed a single organ to rule and oversee the creation of socialism the party. So this is the party that's hopefully going to establish socialism in the Soviet Union, or what will become the Soviet Union, I guess. It's strong, but then they like concentrate the power within the party. The party's sovereign organ was the Central Committee, the top 70 or so officials who were elected annually by party congresses, which later were held ever less frequently. <laughs> but yeah, so the, the Central Committee, and then there was like the Politburo, which would be a concentration within that. So we'll see the formation of the Politburo later, uh, but the Central Committee will come up a lot. In the Kremlin family, the next chapter, we're introduced to some more of Stalin's inner circle, the ones who have been there for most of his political career. Um, and the first man we're introduced to is the only man to shake hands with Lenin, Hitler, Himmler, Goring, Roosevelt, and Churchill. Molotov was Stalin's closest ally. He's he's a really big figure and one that I hadn't known a lot about. Um, he's actually the reason we have Molotov cocktails. They were named not because he invented them, but because they were used against him. <laughs> he was a very diligent worker and very good at his job. And he is ruthless in ways that sometimes Stalin couldn't even be, where Stalin would sometimes waffle over the decision and kind of grieve over, you know, what are the ramifications for this long term? Molotov was down to work and he was down to do as much as was required to get the job done. It's kind of scary the way that like Stalin kind of became the lightning rod when he was not exactly surrounded by like good people. <laughs> so chapter three kind of introduces some of Stalin's early work, his pre-World War II work. And in January 1930, Molotov planned the destruction of the Kulaks. So the Kulaks were a peasant class in Russia who owned at least eight acres of land. And I'm gonna put the conversion for that to kind of give a visual representation of eight acres, because you tell me eight acres, I have no idea what that means. But the Kulaks owned about this much land. Molotov divided them into three categories. He said, first category, to be eliminated immediately. The second, to be imprisoned in camps. The third, 150,000 households to be deported. Molotov oversaw death squads, the railway carriages, and the concentration camps like a military commander. Between five and seven million people ultimately fitted into those three categories. So their first big thing was like, okay, if we're gonna be a socialist state, we need to acquire land. And the best way to do that is to take out an entire class of people and take their land. <laughs> and so the Kulaks were first to go. And it says that Stalin was like a little antsy. He's like, what even is a Kulak, what are we doing? But he's also like, me, okay. Um, chapter four, famine in the country set Stalin at the weekend. It's kind of like just Stalin on vacation with his family, uh, his wife, Nadia, and his uh, children, Vasily and Svetlana, who were uh, Nadia's children. And then they also adopted a boy named Artyom. So those are the three kids and they would like go on vacation frequently. That was the thing is like, despite the very hard working atmosphere, like constantly working, constantly serving the party, they would go on vacation for like a month at a time or something. Uh, the next chapter gets into how important those vacations were. Um, but Famine in the Country set were introduced to Lazar Kaganovich, um, who's another member, I believe, of the Politburo that we'll meet later. <laughs> See, the thing is, is I, I'm introduced to these historical figures the text. But my mind is trying to cycle through an opening scene in Death of Stalin where we're introduced to them that way as well. And I'm trying to guess if this Lazar Kiganovich is present in Death of Stalin. And I think he is. When we're introduced to him, uh, he has an explosive temper like his friend Sergo. Happiest with a hammer in his hand, he often hit his subordinates or lifted them up by their lapels. Yet politically, he was cautious, quick and clever. So that he's going to be another significant figure. But it's time to take the Politburo to the seaside in chapter four. Now, Working on holiday, 
was the best way to get to know Stalin. More careers were made, more intrigues clinched on those sunny verandas than on the snowy battlements of the Kremlin. It mattered more that you could be Stalin's friend than a faithful servant of the party. It mattered more that you could interact with his friends than interact with his colleagues. And if you're gonna be on vacation for a couple months at a time, yeah, it is important that you get in that circle and you get in the door. <laughs> and it is also in this chapter that we're introduced to Lavrenti Beria. But like the latter, Beria was competitive at everything and an avid sport Sportsman, coldly competent, fawningly sycophantic, yet gleaming with mischief. He had a genius for cultivating patrons. In my personal opinion, Beria will be the worst person we meet in this book. And I say that with what we've talked about so far and what we're gonna keep talking about. I'll probably get into it more as we interact with him more and when we get into the death of Stalin as well. Stalin did not leave his children alone with Laurenti Beria, if that tells you anything. The next uh, chapter gets into more of this initiative to seize peasant land and to implement socialism. Uh, we're in 1932 now, and this chapter is called Trains Full of Corpses, Love, Death, and Hysteria. On June 6, 1932, Stalin and Molotov declared that no matter of deviation regarding either amounts or deadliness set for grain deliveries, no matter of deviation regarding either amounts or deadliness set for grain deliveries, Deadlines. That says deadlines. <laughs> On June 6, 1932, Stalin and Molotov declared that no matter of deviation regarding either amounts or deadlines set for grain deliveries can be permitted. Because basically, if you want to force a very agrarian country into being a very industrial country, that growing pain hurts. The death toll of this absurd famine, which only occurred to raise money to build pig iron smelters and tractors was between four to five and as high as 10 million dead, a tragedy unequaled in human history except by Nazi and Maoist terrors. But Lenin himself said the peasant must do a bit of starving. Stalin later told Churchill that this was the most difficult time in his life. Stalin and Lenin, they justified these atrocities and these hardships and these horrible policies because it was necessary in their eyes. And that's where we see the valuing of the party of these political ideals over human life, of seeing it as a necessary thing to achieve what they feel will ultimately help people. They went hard because on July 14th, he put pen to paper ordering Molotov and Kaganovich in Moscow to create a draconian law to shoot hungry peasants who stole even husks of grain. They drew up the notorious decree against misappropriation of socialist property with grievous punishments based on the text of your letter. And on August 7th, this became law. So then we get into uh, Stalin the intellectual because like we're, we're doing the, the strata and we were taking care of the agriculture and work functions to create this socialist utopia. So now we gotta go below and do like the arts. Stalin gathered like a bunch of artists and painters and writers together and he told them the artist ought to show life truthfully and if he shows our life truthfully he cannot fail to show it moving towards socialism. This is and will be socialist realism. And Simon goes on to say that, in other words, the writers had to describe what life should be, a panegyric to the utopian future, not what life was. That was like a line that stuck with me because I couldn't, I wasn't sure if it was Stalin like, well, of course it's gonna move towards that because if you show life the way it was, of course it's moving that way. Or you have to show it moving this way regardless of whether or not that's what it's happening. And I think that's gonna be the big like tension within his own mind, I think of like, is that what's happening or is it not? And we kind of end part one with an acknowledgement that Stalin could certainly appreciate genius, but as with love and family, his belief in Marxist progress was brutally paramount. And that ends part one, as I said, and it gets into part two, the Jolly Fellows, Stalin and Kirov, uh, which is 1932 to 1934, my bad. This part went by really quickly. I had to reread certain portions of it. And we get this tension between Stalin and his friend Kirov. So I say close friend, that's not always like a great place to be. We see that in this tension of succession because the last duty of a Congress is to elect the central committee. And this was usually just a formality. If you were in, you were in. Uh, Stalin's friend Kirov proposed Beria to join the central committee so that'll get him in the door. But the way the votes were counted, I had to reread that a couple times because it wasn't clear because the votes came in and it looked like Kirov had more votes than Stalin and Stalin kind of took that personally. And so he's like, certainly, 166 votes are still missing. Stalin received 1,056 votes and Kirov received 1,055 votes 
out of 1059. So something seems weird with the math. <laughs> Despite the fact that Stalin and Kirov were friends, Stalin was very threatened by Kirov's per like popularity. And so Stalin was like, hey, instead of you going to Leningrad, why don't you stay here, become a secretary? And on the one hand, it satisfied people who wanted to promote Kirov to a secretariat position. Uh, but for Stalin, this would put Kirov under his observation and it would cut him off from the people at Leningrad who could serve as a nefarious influence. Next chapter though is called Assassination of the Favorite and pretty soon after Kirov was elected to be a secretariat he falls like deathly ill. And there's a passage on 142 that says when burial was involved it was indeed foolish to take one's illnesses lightly. Part two ends with Kirov's death and so that is how we go into part three on the brink which will be 1934 to 1936. We still have several chapters to go before we get into like World War II, um, but World War II I think will dominate the back half of the book. It's super interesting. I really love like just the intrigue of it all. I know it sounds kind of cheap to be like the world building, but in all seriousness there's a lot of really neat elements to draw from. Like if you want political intrigue and backstabbing, you have a setup where the party, the goals, the political ideology is everything and that's what everyone says but under the surface it matters way more who you are friends with and who you are loyal to because if you're loyal to the wrong people they'll say well they don't really love the party and you can get kicked out or worse. <laughs> I'm very interested to see where we go from here. I hope you enjoyed this. It was a little bit longer. I wanted to get a little more in depth because I want to basically give you as much framing as possible before we get to Death of Stalin. <laughs> if you want to cut corners I guess you can watch History Buff's video on it. It just kind of goes through the movie and what happened in real life. But we have so many more people we have to meet. I am flagging literally everything. Um, and I'm, I'm very interested to see where it goes from here. Again, thank you so much for watching. We'll be back in a couple weeks with probably parts three, four, and five, ideally. And I will keep you up to date with all of the drama going down in the Soviet Union. But yeah, I think that should be the end of your dry cycle. Take the towels out, feel them against your face. They feel nice, don't they? I hope you have a lovely evening and I will see you all next time.